artiste. As Jacqueline Mayakovsky deftly tacked up yet another rectangle of daubed sugar paper, Dr. Greenhouse speculated idly. Why was this mysterious girl in the paint-stained smock continually putting up these delinquents' paintings day after day as if to cover every surface in the building? Perhaps she found this display of motor skills compulsive, yet therapeutic. More likely she was an amnesiac performance artist, stranded in the school long after the expiry of her corporate sponsorship, and now unable ever to face her journey home across the reptile-infested subways of the ruined city. She was smiling enigmatically, like the sun-faded clipping of Brigitte Bardot he'd found pasted inside a staff room locker, and her lips flickered, as if in synchronisation with some fleeting subliminal impulse. But her comment was drowned in the roar of a sea king landing in the playground outside, bringing in another contingent of exhausted riot police and bewildered behavioural dysfunction specialists. Everywhere they were arriving too late. Their clients, an army of proletarian artistes manqués, were fleeing the schools in their thousands. As the helicopter settled, whirling vortices of dust and litter were scattered against the chain links of the playground perimeter fence. Exhibit 2000 Every morning, after a night of uneasy dreams on the broken staff room furniture and token breakfast from a vandalised vending machine, he would try to decode the latent content of these infantile artefacts. Jacqueline Mayakovsky continued her silent work throughout the night, like a spectral handmaiden of Delvaux gliding through the marble amphitheatres of sleep. Soon she would have decorated every floor of a nine-storey building with the pupil's imagery. He wandered among their abstractions, crude spirals of cerise or magenta hanging like deranged miniature galaxies against the grey rectangular geometries of the dinner room. Upstairs, the walls outside the biology lab were covered in watercolour surreal pastiches Cryptozoic vegetation sprouting a giant penis with a bow tie, an insect-headed woman with a flaming whip. The landscapes of such primal terrors were presumably beyond the reach of the cadres of psychotherapists and social workers who had once filled the school every day. Indeed, Despite his own basic training in psychopathology, a hurried crash course before his enforced redeployment to the school, Greenhouse was unable to enter the mindscapes of these remedial room Darleys and Ernsts. But once prized doctorate in comparative literature that had hung over his desk at all souls, was little use to him now in his role as a supply teacher. He should have taken up that option of communications consultant with the Mitsugichi Corporation. But it was too late now. Media Master. In the English department stockroom, among the piles of burned books, he found a working TV set. As bands of purple cloud darkened around the silhouettes of the gutted office buildings, Greenhouse watched the headmaster guesting on an early evening talk show. We are bringing them back into the school system, the head told the studio audience. And we shall restart the heart of our nation's classrooms with our pedagogic skills, our curriculum mapping skills, our pastoral management skills. We are waiting to reclaim our youth any day now. It is not an impossible task. Greenhouse had not seen a pupil for 17 days, and now only a handful of teachers managed to arrive for the staff meetings and case conferences that at once dominated their working day. Those who survived commuting by armoured bus left well before dusk. Many, like the melancholy Traven or the introverted Kersler, had been kidnapped or killed by their ex-pupils who now owed their loyalties to rival groups of local militia, 
each flaunting its distinctive style of weaponry and sportswear. Greenhouse heard a footstep in the corridor and instinctively reached for his largactyl gun. Although its last dart had been discharged long ago, he found its presence reassuring. But the presence on the doorway was Jacqueline Mayakovsky, who removed her dark glasses and produced a luger from under her iridescent plastic raincoat. She held it in both hands like a female investigator and had rerun of the Rockford Files. He could hear the distant throb of the helicopters. You're always in the way, Dr Greenhouse. I've waited hours to get access to this room for the exhibition. You're all making it impossible for us. Calmly she fired into the heart of the TV set. The headmaster's face imploded. The Catalogue of Apocalypse After their encounter in the English stockroom, Greenhouse saw little of Jacqueline Mayakovsky in the days that followed. He imagined she held some private territory of her own, perhaps in the art studios on the fourth floor where he, she nurtured edible fungi or cultivated luminous crystals. The security staff had finally withdrawn for the duration and there was no one else left to challenge their free movement around the building or indeed question any aspect of their identity. Greenhouse was more preoccupied with the increasing difficulty of finding food in the roach-infested kitchens, and with his ongoing attempt to devise a definitive collection of significant artefacts. His own response to the proliferating collage of pictures that covered the interior walls of the building is uniquely private view. Patrolling the site and picking out litter had always been one of his regular academic duties. Now it was imperative for his psychic survival, a perverse archaeology of the future. As he discovered the objects, he assembled them in one of the English department classrooms and spread them across the empty desks, visual aids for an object lesson in his own increasingly facile consciousness. At the end of the day, he itemised them in an old register. Fourth year worksheets on AIDS with bar charts on the spread of HIV infection and a comprehension passage on the symptomatic presentation of Kaposi's sarcoma. Video cassette of the slow learning, presumably a tape used in teacher training. Broken surveillance camera torn from the lobby in a recent incident with intruders. Torn copy of Sunday Sport headline. Schoolgirl six in a bed romp with Sir. Life size papier-mâché effigy of Salman Rushdie with pins protruding and extensive scorch marks made by Wahid or Ale. Star Vader's pocket electronic grain. Destroy Earth in order to save it. Audio cassette. Chaos path working tape. Gives keys and formulae for tapping into the void flow of infinite potential. Polaroid snap of Jacqueline Mayakovsky in deep trance, scraping particles of clay off a potter's wheel, possibly a promotional photo for the school's creative arts course, more likely part of the documentation of a long-term time-based art activity. Broken 12-inch single, style assessment by the Quantum Brothers, the terminal death house mix, EEG records of staff alpha and theta rhythms in simulated stress situations. Tissue samples in vitro labelled left hemisphere, Wernicke's area, a typical 14 year old. Designs for cosmetically effective client friendly CS gas masks abandoned for budgetary reasons at the testing stage. Confidential minutes of a staff disciplinary hearing. Dr G's mood swings give rise to profound anxieties at the pastoral pupil interface level. Red alert. The classroom was empty, like a drained swimming pool. However, although the effort of scouring the overturned filing cabinets in the headmaster's office had exhausted Dr Greenhouse, he still stood for a full 55 minutes at the front of the darkening room, 
shouting at the overturned chairs and tables, as if trying to admonish a gang of escaping poltergeists. Despite himself, it was impossible to stop his anxiety ritual of teaching. The rigid templates of a timetable had been etched into his fragile spinal geometry over years, maybe decades in the industry. His neural warning systems had been on full alert for so long, he couldn't remember a time when he hadn't spent most of his waking hours preempting hostile missile attacks or intervening in minor tribal conflicts. The blank cuboid geometry of a room, its insolent void of wired glass and grubby melamine, might even now conceal some vindictive prank learned from Ulster or Vietnam, a sticky membrane of Semtex under a pile of folders, a poison thumbtack on the teacher's chair. He groped for the edge of the graffiti gouge chalkboard, his pitted lips twitching, his arms waving in the familiar rhythms of exhortation and rebuke, his ears already roaring with the white noise of rioting adolescent mobs, his vision a reddish mist of primal fury. It was his responsibility to preserve world peace. But this was a crisis of the cerebellum, the deep brain, the saurian guardian of his most secret uterine territories, the mesozoic realms of his id. His adrenaline overload would rush him down the time corridors to press the red button to unleash the purifying radiation of his submerged megatons, those ultimate global peacemakers, which alone could bring him the primeval Silence, he craved, the infinite silence of archaeopsychic time. That would teach them a lesson. Madonna of the Suburbs When, hours later, he awoke from the sudden fugue, he found himself sprawled on the floor, hands around the charred throat of the Salman Rushdie effigy, which was already crumbling into fragments like a ravaged mummy. The file drill alarm was still buzzing, a high-pitched sine wave undulating monotonously as a line of man-made concrete dunes on a weapons testing range. Jacqueline Mayakovsky stood over him with a cup of black coffee and an apple. Her long iridescent coat hung from her shoulders like the plumage of an exotic bird. You're getting carried away again, Dr. Greenhouse. She knelt and studied the suctures of his skull with clinical calm. These fantasies of cosmic destruction and recreation are all in your head. She had the bright but firm manner of a young mother confronting a wayward toddler in its first Freudian excesses. You're suffering from iconic overdose, Doctor. It's just one of the symptoms. If you had to study these children's pictures for months on end, as I have, you might begin to understand the whole syndrome. You better hurry up before I start taking the exhibition down. She raised the coffee cup to his lips and glided away. He would imagine her now as a housewife in the lost paradises of the leafy suburbs, guiding anima of Botticelli and garden parties, an enigmatic Madonna smiling down from the balconies of memory. The Terminal Reports In the evenings, as he sat in the physics labs on the sixth floor, the signals from hundreds of orbiting TV satellites penetrating every tissue of his body, Greenhouse was sometimes tempted to pick up his infrared binoculars and scan the tower blocks on the far side of the motorway. He hoped to see somebody watching alien porn, some ghostly conjunction of limbs as distant as implausible as the docking of Iraqi and Iranian space modules. But tonight, as every night, he only glimpsed the dark outline of satellite dishes, tiny excrescent fungi sprouting above blank windows and empty walkways. Soon he was overcome by his other obsessive urge to complete his terminal reports a task as huge and seemingly futile as Jacqueline Mayakovsky's exhibition, curated for pupils and parents who had long ago turned their backs on the static handmade artefact 
to participate in the ever-shifting continuum of an exploding electronic universe. A few lights flickered in the towers, like cave fires in a cliff face of the night. He tried to ignore their allure as he thumbed through the interleaved carbons of the report forms and attempted to find convincing formulae to explain the increasing inability of the species to educate its offspring. Lack of attention, violently disruptive behaviour and habitual non-attender. The ready-made phrases in boxes designed for faster ticking and a rationalised assessment procedure no longer made sense for clients whose hyperfast senses were unsystematically deranged. They had long since taken the extra mural option. The rumble of distant explosions and the disported blare of sound systems on the night wind disturbed its concentration. The actual topology of the laboratory, its cage-like enclosure of space, was contracting around him as if the gravity of his presence was warping the flickering fluorescent night. He had to move from this constricting spatio-temporal matrix. As he left, in search of Jacqueline Mayakovsky and her sibylline folios, he tossed the report forms into a waste bin and added a lighted match. The Impossibility Exhibition You see, Doctor, the pictures regress as the pupils get older. Jacqueline Mayakovsky sat among the Rousseau-esque jungle of her potted plants and sifted through the piles of pictures. Here is a stand of third-year fantasy. She pointed to one of the pseudo-surrealist gouaches that Greenhouse had noticed outside the life science room. In a burning desert, under orange skies, a squat, headless, earth-coloured hermaphrodite was being eaten by a robust Christiason. The picture was entitled Death World, James Tallis, 3B. Now, that's just apocalyptic mannerism, I realise, she added, half apologetically, but compare it to what last year's fifth years were doing. The wall behind her was papered with torn sheets covered in wild scrawls, gestural spray gun marks, a demented calligraphy that seemed compelled to cross a given space with as many savage loops and violent intersections as possible, as if that were the only way it could trace and affirm its actuality in a polymorphous perverse act of self-obliteration. It's not just like the territorial death tags on the subway, she said, with a faint shudder. Greenhouse recalled how travellers sometimes blundered into inner-city free fire zones, often dying horribly simply because they couldn't read such sinister tribal glyphs. This is a collection of autographs by a generation of autists. I'm not an intellectual doctor. I'll leave the rest of the explanations to you. She made for the door. She tried to follow but her sure-footed agility had already taken her up the first turn of the darkened stairwell. His route also went upwards through the smoke-filled corridors where he lost her. Terminal Exhibitionist An electron, shouted Dr Greenhouse to the masses far below, is a photonic system trapped in a space-time cavity. Police searchlights stabbed the night sky. A rising wind was blowing bitterly up here on the roof of the school, and he doubted if the young bodies pressed against the mesh of the playground fence could hear a word. The cheap megaphone was already filtering and processing his utterance, turning him into a mere transient sample in an acid house mixed down. In any case, he was certain that the crowd had been drawn by huge tongues of flame now licking the windows of the labs, under the impression that this was the work of their peers. They were chanting unintelligibly and surging against the wire, as if firemen began to run a hydraulic hoist up the sheer glass side of the building. Policemen with perspex shields glinting in the firelight formed a hollow square around the edge of the playground. A smaller group of officers, marksmen, trained negotiators, 
were waving him down. He gripped the side of a ventilation duct and began to hurl textbooks into the darkness, but it was a futile display. It was only a matter of time as to who would get to him first, the kids or the educational security forces. Both extrapolations were negative. He had only minutes to finish his exposition. Time Windows 1 Greenhouse threw away the megaphone and lifted a pocket cassette machine to his lips. Despite the increasing noise and smoke, he was determined to fire his last report from the terminal zone. The students' paintings are not merely the expression of anomie or socio-economic malaise. They are semiotics of a mutant ontology, an autistic withdrawal from the physical constraints of Newtonian time and causality. Faced with the conflicting claims of reality and the virtual reality of the electronic media landscape, with bewildering seductions of hyper-possibility in which even the simplest of our actions create an unpredictable wave front of improbability, they are seeking relief in atavism. He crouched on the flat asphalt roof, shouting into the tiny microphone while the great rotors of the Sea King throbbed overhead. For, as they accelerate along the time gradient of adolescence towards adulthood, they feel increasingly trapped in the black hole of their own body identities. The continuum folds back in on them, like the roof of a sabotage aircraft. Matter itself is a time trap. Time Windows 2 As armed educational security officers leapt from the hatch of the Sea King, Greenhouse wondered if Jacqueline Mayakovsky had escaped the multi-story inferno. He could not help feeling admiration and even affection for this serene, self-possessed young woman who had survived the horrors of the recent months with such grace and aplomb. He wished he paid greater attention during her earlier conversational gambits about everyday hobbies like cycling or swimming or handicrafts. A gun barrel prodded his left pectoral. He didn't resist as two burly Australian orderlies grabbed his arms while a thin lizard-faced medic searched for a vein in his scamped flesh. As the needle sank in, the gannet-like screaming of the children slowly faded like a huge panoramic sweep of white noise, and the whine of the helicopter turbine sank to a diminuendo. He looked up. It was almost dawn. Light was breaking against the black towers, bursting through the terraced citadels of indigo cloud, and against the light he could perceive motion, avian movement, the beat of angelic wings. In her flimsy, handmade craft of paper and wood, the ornithroptic bird woman of the art room was rising on the thermals of the burning school, far above the all-consuming flames of the impossibility exhibition, towards her reborn paradises in the forests of the south.